it's just great to, uh, to start the year and uh, be together. You know, our first, this is our second in person, really, since the pandemic. And uh, it's just great to be here um, together. Thank you. I say to the secretary, um, it's not as easy as the old days when I would call you and we'd schedule this date and I'd pick up a few donuts at Doughboys and we'd have a breakfast. <laughs> uh, times have changed. And uh, that requires, that really, uh, I have to thank a lot of people who uh, really uh, collaborated together to put this event together. Uh, my assistant, uh, Julie Attridge, who uh, works for me and for three or four other lawyers and uh, our, our new uh, Alicia Mack and Emily Vanderpool from our marketing, uh, Nolan Hart from operations, the catering folks from Flick were great people, the, the building security, and uh, of course my, the co-managing partners, Mike Scott and, and Liam O'Connell, and of course all of my partners here at the firm who support these events uh, all the time. And of course the secretary staff, uh, Akisha and uh, Raquel in the, in the security team, and really the building security. They all really worked together the last several days. I just didn't realize um, how, much is, how much goes into an event. Uh, and I mean that when I say times have changed. It really is. Really is um, but thank you to everybody uh, who worked together to make it uh, come off like this. And thank you for your cooperation. And thank you for being here and always supporting uh, these events that I put on now for over 20 years. So it's been great. Um, just two things. I wanted to start just... If we can just reflect for a second uh, on, the, on the year that's passed and uh, reflect on those in our lives that uh, you know, we've lost, that passed away, our fa family members, our friends, our colleagues. And uh, if we can just pause, uh, just pause for a moment and uh, uh, together, if that's okay. Thank you very much. And I know I sent this out, but I did just want to extend this to you. Uh, as a New Year's blessing that I have put together. And may the road you walk be a smooth one. May your troubles be few, if any. May the days and years that lie ahead be healthy, happy, and merry. May you have friends in abundance. May the sun shine bright around you. May the world be a wonderful place to live. And may God's love always surround you. And that's my blessing to all of us, and uh, Happy New Year to all of you. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you. There you go. I want to introduce Attorney Dean Mulhern, who joined Nutter in May of this year. And Dean, uh, most recently, was the first assistant uh, district attorney in Suffolk County, and before that was chief of public safety for Mayor Walsh, and before that was the chief of the gang unit in, in, in Suffolk County. So uh, please welcome Attorney Dean Mulhern. Dean. You'll all have to excuse me a bit. I had a, a surprise gift from my children, uh, a new puppy, and it scratched my right cornea on, um, <laughs> on New Year's Day, so I can't read from anything. But it's, it's just a great honor and privilege to have the Secretary here with us today to, to start the new year. It's difficult. Um, Nutter competes to be a Boston institution, and we've done a pretty good job for over 100 years. The Red Sox have been here for a long time. We have ducklings in the Boston Common, but um, I think when anyone thinks about Boston um, or um, has a thought about what Boston stands for, the first thing they very likely think of is Secretary and former Mayor uh, Martin Walsh. So on behalf of Nutter, uh, on behalf of all our guests and friends here today, um, we can't tell you how excited we are to have him uh, to start this new year off. Secretary Walsh. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. I thought about how I would join Dan in an introduction with the Secretary, and I, I, I thought of a story that I had heard. My, my family, my wife and my daughter, who are both here, we always enjoyed that show. West Wing, West Wing. <laughs> and recently, they were, during Thanksgiving and um, Christmas, there was the West Wing Mega Marathon. 
<laughs> and I, I watched a lot of them. <laughs> and as you remember, of course, you had Martin Sheen, the president. You had this character named Josh Lyman, was this aggressive legislative director. And you had the chief of staff to the president, Leo McGarry. <laughs> and he was this quintessential chief of staff, uh, had been a hard, hard nosed, loyal as can be, the last person the president relied upon. And he had some very similar characteristics as our guest today. He was from Boston, he was Catholic. He was Irish. He had one of the episodes. He had been a recovering alcoholic and addict, and that was several of the episodes were about that. In a prior administration, he was the Secretary of Labor. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? I don't know if that's good or bad. But yeah. <laughs> and and the way I want, the way I you know, I have a long friendship with the Secretary, of course, but. There's an episode where there's an assassination attempt on the president. He wasn't shot, and, but Josh Lyman, the young guy, was shot. And seriously, and operated on, and recovered. He came back to work, but suffered from depression, suffered from post-traumatic stress, and was behaving badly. And one day, he came in with a big white bandage around his hand. And Leo McGarry noticed this and said, what happened? I put my hand through a window. I put my hand, I, I, I cut my hand on a, on a glass on a table. And but his, his behavior was just erratic and, and not good. So Leo brought in a specialist, a trauma doctor. And one day he had a session with Josh, all day session. And they finally broke through after many, many hours of going back and forth when he admitted how he felt that he had put his hand through a glass window in his house. And the session ended, he goes out, and there's Leo McGarry sitting there. Leo, you're waiting for me. Yes. How did it go? How'd you make out? And Josh said, oh, he thinks I have an eating disorder. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Leo didn't laugh. And then Josh admitted, Leo, I didn't pick my hand on a glass. I put it through a window. And then Leo said, I want to tell you a story. There was a guy walking down the street, and he fell down a hole. A deep, dark, steep hole. And he yelled and yelled for help. No one heard him. A priest walks by. Help me, help me, the fellow said. The priest said, here's a prayer. Say this prayer. Another fellow walked by. It was a doctor. Help me, doctor, help me. Here's a prescription. <coughs> Take this. And he went on his way. A friend then walked by. And he heard him. Help me, help me. What did the friend do? He jumped into the hole with the fellow. And the fellow says, what did you do that for? We are both stuck down here now. And the friend said, I've been down this hole before, and I know the way out. Follow me. And that's really, I think, a lot of what the secretary, whether he was a mayor, whether he was a state representative, or whether he was a person in the community, he has helped so many people through his own personal challenges, personal successes, find the way out when they were down in that hole, like many of us are sometimes. So I uh, just want to welcome the Secretary here today and thank him for all he does for, for all of us. Secretary Walsh. Thank you, Billy, and um, I want to thank you for uh, for that introduction. Thank you for uh, that was an amazing show. I watched. I, I I just started watching West Wing about six months ago uh, because I didn't watch it the first time, and um, it's pretty accurate. Uh, <laughs> so I want to. Uh, I want to. Well, at least a, a part of on the show. I don't know if I'm going to be cheap with staff, but we'll leave that one alone. Um, I want to thank. It's great to be here today. It's great to see so many friends. I was actually. Uh, excited about speaking here this morning and coming to, to see you because I knew there's going to be a lot of friends here and I was going to give some shout outs but Jesus if I start shouting out and then miss somebody so if I give shout outs and I don't mention you it doesn't mean I don't love you it's just I couldn't get you into the speech because uh, I'm looking at my, my life my political world uh, I have my friends from from the legislature when I started uh, in the back row there uh, and I see people from City Hall here that I work with uh, that I used to work in City Hall I see a lot of folks from City Hall still work there uh, people that worked in, in different parts of my life, thank you very much. 
Um, just two quick, quick stories, one about Billy, one about Danny. Uh, Billy Kennedy, when I first got elected to the state house, I was a brand new state representative uh, and I had run on um, a bunch of things I was gonna do for the district. I was gonna, things that Richie Rouse couldn't do. Yeah, get the three, the three red line stations done over, Pope John Paul Park done, the extension done, and all of this different stuff. And, and it helped tremendously because uh, Paul Haley's here, the chairman of Ways and Means, and, and I got called to the roster one, roster one day, and Paul couldn't understand how a, a state rep who's been there for literally five minutes was able to secure about $120 million in the budget. And in large part, it was because of Tommy Finneran. Uh, but Billy Kennedy calls me up to the rostrum, and I go up to the rostrum, and, and he says to me, uh, well, I got something to tell you. I said, what is it? He said, well, uh, we're going to give you uh, $78 million for the f three red line stations, and we're going to add a fourth one in to redo. These are the last ones done on, on, the, on the trains. And we're going to give you $25 million for Pope John Paul Park. And we're going to give you $7 million for the extension. We're going to give you $2 million for Tinian Beach. And we're going to give you another $2.5 million for Savin Hill Beach to renovate. And literally, in the first, like, in the first, like, three months of me being a state rep, I, I fulfilled every campaign promise. <laughs> and, I, and I want to thank you, Billy, for that, uh, making me look really well in launching my career. Um, so I appreciate you with that support. Um, that's things that Rosemary Powers and Martha Coakley said I would never get done as a candidate for state representative. <laughs> you know, the, so I want to thank you. Th thank you for that. Uh, and then, and then, uh, and Danny Mulhern, um, when I became the mayor of Boston, um, we were looking at uh, police community relations back in 2013. And there wasn't really a lot of talk of it back then. It was right before Ferguson had happened, the shooting in Ferguson, Missouri. And, and what, we, what we looked at in saying that we can't expect the police department to get us, build community relations, build trust in the community, and do their job. And I brought Danny in and a few other folks, and we created an Office of Public Safety. And that Office of Public Safety was to go out into the communities and to build trust and to help create opportunities. And, and throughout that time, we also created a program called Operation Exit with the building trades, where we took kids, young people, uh, and some older people, that were court-involved, crime-involved, had parole, probation, had done stints in jail, prison time, uh, and we put people, worked with the building trades and put people into the unions. And, and the program ended up, in our time, uh, about 92% of the participants were African-American, zero recidivism rate, uh, and, and people that went to the program are still working today. And, 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 you know, it's amazing what you can see when you put your mind together and put programs in place that actually work with outcomes that are important. And I want to thank Danny for that and a bunch of other things that Danny has done as well. So I want to thank you, Danny, for that as well. Uh, I want to thank everyone here at Nutter uh, for allowing me the opportunity to, to come and say a few words today. Uh, I truly appreciate it. Uh, I want to uh, thank everyone um, for in this room. I look around the room. There's so many people here that have been part of Boston's success in so many different ways. Um, and, and it's just amazing to see you all here today. Uh, I want to say thank you um, for, for all that you do in the city. Uh, I'm just going to... I have, to, I have to talk about being mayor for a minute because there's so many folks here that, that are in the room that were part of, of what we were able to accomplish in the city of Boston in seven, a little, little more than seven years in the city. And, and I just want to just, a couple of things that we were able to do. And I think about when I ran for mayor uh, in 2013, uh, I was, one of the uh, publications in the city uh, criticized me saying I'd be terrible for business, I'd be awful for the city, I'd drive the city backwards, it, I couldn't be a fiscal steward and, and, and I wouldn't be able to do what I wanted to do, I wouldn't be able to do what we need to do for the city. That was all over, well, actually both, both papers had it. Um, and, and, and it was fine, but I, I knew different. And, and first and foremost, we surrounded ourselves with great people. And many of the folks are in this room here today. And, and if, I'll shut you out maybe in a little bit, but I want to thank you for your work, because I know when I left it was quick, because the, the president called and asked me to serve in his cabinet. And it was bittersweet when I, when I got that call and that appointment to serve in the cabinet. But I want to thank each and every one of you in this room that worked with me and with us to collectively together to do some amazing things in the city. Uh, we added 140,000 jobs uh, in the city of Boston in seven years. Um, we added the, to the job base by 20%. We had a AAA bond rating seven consecutive years by Standard & Poor's & Moody's. First time in the history of the city of Boston where it had seven years of AAA bond rating. We grew our tax base carefully, invested in our neighborhoods equally and equitable across the city of Boston, investing in our parks. I see David Leonard from the library, the amazing work that David's done at the library, we bring all the new branches and what's happening in Copley Square and all the groundbreakings that are still happening and all the ribbon cuttings that are happening. Uh, just the amazing work. People said when we took over as, 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 as mayor that the libraries, no fault of anybody, but libraries are a thing of the past. 
when we started to invest in libraries, people started to come back to libraries. And then when COVID-19 happened, our libraries just took off. The online versions took off, and more and more people started using our libraries. We responded to the pandemic by bringing our city together. Uh, all people in this room, there are people in this room from the, from the, the BPDA, Brian and Renee and, and John and Heather and, and those folks that, that are responsible for uh, development all of a sudden decided to put that aside and, and help serve lunches and help people in the community and doing things that we did things. So we made sure that people in the city of Boston were taken care of. In our first year of the pandemic, we approved 10,000 units of housing in the city. As mayor, we approved over 50,000 units of housing in the city to keep up with the construction, the building that's going on in our city of Boston. We added 90 million square feet of new development to the city of Boston. We continue to do that. And when I say that, we did it collectively with a lot of you in this room too, with the business community. I see Pat Brophy over there. Pat did some amazing work in our city as well. But the business community, thank you for what you did in our city of Boston, what you do in our city of Boston every single day. And continue to invest in the city of Boston. Continue to stay here in the city of Boston. Continue to move our city forward because this is a great city. I've had the chance to go around the country. I've been to 42 different states since I've been in this job. And in about 19, 20 months I've been in this job. I've been to 42 different states. I've been to many cities multiple times. I can honestly say there is no city that I've come in contact with that I've visited, that I've seen. There's great cities in America. There's no city like Boston, Massachusetts. There really isn't when you think about, when you look around the country and see what we have in the, in the city. I want to thank also, uh, there's so many, we house 2,500 people, 2,500 homeless people. I know Lindia Downey from Pine Street's here. Thank you, Lindia, in our time as mayor of Boston. We created Boston's Way Home Fund. There's a building being built right now in Jamaica Plain. Instead of having our second inaugural, we, we set up a fund to raise money, raised over $10 million, and other organizations stepped up and helped in a big way to that. I want to thank you. We also, we also made Boston a national leader in good jobs, innovation, investments, and also in social justice. Just social justice. I want to thank Michael Curry, uh, the president at the time of the NAACP, who, who I've known Michael for a long time, and Michael challenged me as mayor. Uh, he challenged me. Where are you, Michael? Right there. Michael challenged me as mayor and made me think about are we doing the right things. It wasn't about doing a speech. It was about making a change and making investments. And that was the whole administration's goal to do that. And they were able to do that. The Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott Memorial, King Memorial are being unveiled in Boston Common next week. Um, and that some of that work came out of that. I want to thank Paul English, too, for making that first million dollar investment to make that happen. It's the first memorial. Well, it's not the first in the city. There's one over at BU, but it's the first real memorial that's happening to, to m m remember Dr. King and Coretta Scott for their contributions, their amazing contributions, and, and, and to, to, this, to this country, to this city, to this country, and this world. As mayor, I learned that if we come together and we work together, we can move forward together. I've taken that same understanding and that same desire to Washington with me in, in the work I do as Secretary of Labor for the United States of America. Um, unifying the country is, is the core value of President Biden. Uh, and Vice President Harris and, and the entire administration. And it's getting results. And despite what the feeling we have today, I want everyone just to remember back where we are today. In March of 2022, 2020, in my office, I called the cabinet. Laura Jerry was there. Alexis Finner was there. A bunch of you, Pat was there. A bunch of other, Brian was there. A few other folks were there. And I brought, David was there. I brought everyone into my office. And I said, this is what we have to do. We have to shut the city down. We have to shut our schools down. Our colleges are going to shut down. Our businesses are going to close. Our restaurants, we're not, going to, not sure what's going to happen to our restaurants. People are going to be working from home, whatever that means. That was really before Zoom. But as a city, we need to continue to move forward. And for, the, for, for about a year, a year, there was no national plan. There was no plan on how to move our country forward. There was certainly no plan on myself and, and Governor Baker were working on, on a daily call uh, about how do, we, how, do we, how do we get by and what we did. But we're able to move forward because this, this region and this area has amazing people. Down in Washington, when the president uh, became the president, um, there was 10 and a half million Americans out of work. We didn't really, ha we, had we had a vaccine, but we had no plan for to distribute the vaccine. We had really no plan to get people back to work. We had no plan to kind of continue our economy moving forward. President enacted the, the biggest recovery package since the Franklin Delano Roosevelt era in the 1930s. Since that time, the United States has added 10.5 million jobs to our economy. The economy grew by 3.2% in the third quarter. The unemployment rate has stayed near or, or historic lows of 3.7%.
in, in the African American community is 5.7% and the Latino community is 3.7%. Those are near record lows. We still have inequities though in the African American community. We have a 5.7% unemployment rate when the rest of the country is 3.7%. So we're gonna work on that. Gas prices are lower than they were before Putin invaded Ukraine. The real wages went up in November as wages outgrowth outpaced inflation. The president also is responsible for the biggest infrastructure investment since President Eisenhower in the 1950s. Already we've announced over $185 billion in funding for 7,000 projects, infrastructure projects all across the United States of America, including 2,800 bridges that need to be repaired or replaced, thousands of clean fuel buses for schools and transit systems. Nearly 15 million people have been enrolled in affordable high-speed internet in, in, in this country. We were able to cut a deal in Boston to bring broadband access to the city of Boston. But when the, when the schools closed down, we had to buy 40,000 hotspots because kids in our city didn't have internet in their home. And many of our kids all across America didn't have internet across America, whether it's urban America, rural America. Many people went home to work and they had to drive to a parking lot to pick up the Wi-Fi from a, from a fast food restaurant. 15 million people today have, have enrolled in affordable high-speed internet, and the, the plan is $52 billion investment to make sure that every American has access to high-speed internet in the United States of America. And there's much more. The Chips and Science Act has launched a new era of American manufacturing success. The Chips Bill, the Chips Act, sparked a $200 billion private investment in this country. It's creating good jobs and strengthening our supply chain. The Chips Bill is, is the microchips that are in our computers. We invented them in the United States of America, and we weren't making any of them. And the president said, we want to make those here in America. And one of the first companies to step out to the plate was Intel with a $20 billion private investment to create a manufacturing facility in Ohio, along with other parts of the country now where we have more of those happening. So we're bringing manufacturing back to the United States of America. It's also not surprising that voters returned the best midterm elections for the first term president since John F. Kennedy 60 years ago. The American people want to keep, continue to move this country forward. In 2023, you're going to see an even bigger positive impact from historic legislative record that the president was able to pass, on a, in many cases, a bipartisan way, working with our friends in the Republican Party to make sure that we do this bipartisan-wise. The Inflation Reduction Act went into effect this week. It lowers health care costs for our seniors and small business owners and families. It launches the, clean, the biggest clean energy and climate investments our nation has ever seen. In, right here in, in this room, the Green Ribbon Commission talks about in the, the environment. And, and we, we haven't had a federal investment like this ever in the United States of America. Now we have that investment here in the United States of America. Whether you're developing real estate that uses clean energy, buying an electric car, putting a roof, solar pan, roof on your, on your, a solar panel on your roof, the law empowers you to be part of the solution. Fundamentally, the president's economic strategy is all about good jobs with equity and access for all communities. And at the Department of Labor, we're playing a central role in all of this different legislation that was passed on, on, in, in Congress. We began the year by launching the Good Jobs Initiative. It's a collaborative effort across the government and the private sector, working with partners and working with the cabinet to make sure new federal investments are creating good jobs, pathways for those jobs, for women into those jobs for people of color into those jobs, for veterans into those jobs, and people who need a second chance into those jobs. Those are all the things that I learned here as mayor of the city of Boston. Those are all the things that I brought to Washington to see that we can make a difference on a global scale, on a national scale, by making investments and really making sure these initiatives are working really well. And we're working with employers because it's key to have employers at the table. When I, when I, got, when I was going for my confirmation as Secretary of Labor, I was asked a question by Senator Burr, a Republican from North Carolina, if I'm willing to work with commerce to talk about putting commerce and labor back together so it's not labor over here and commerce over here. And I said, that's how I operate. And today I have a great relationship with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I have a great relationship with the AFL-CIO. I have a great relationship with the Manufacturing Association. I have a great relationship with worker rights organizations. It's important to bring them both together because you can't do one without the other successfully. And it's important showing, and we did that here in the city of Boston as well. We're working on also with flexibility in the workplace, whether it's paid family leave, which is important for women and families all in our country, or high-quality job training, creating access to, to good jobs. 
We're doubling down on apprenticeship, registered apprenticeship programs. It's the most powerful and proven strategy that we have in our country. We hear a lot right now in the country about people not going to work and all these jobs being unfilled. Well, a lot of them are unfilled because we don't have people skilled to take those jobs. And what do we expect? If we don't have job training and apprenticeship, how do we expect somebody who's working in a job today in a different job that can't find their way into a good paying job? When you go to Europe and you look at companies in Europe, they have apprenticeship programs at, in high school. And young people have the opportunity to get exposed to these jobs. We have, we have some work programs here in the United States and here in Boston. We have to double down on this. And something that apprenticeships offers tremendous value and opportunity. When we think of apprenticeships, when I first heard apprenticeships, I was thinking apprenticeships, building trades. The first thing that pops in my head. There is no reason why we can't have apprenticeships in other, other areas. Under President Biden, Biden's leadership, we invested $300 million in registered apprenticeships. We're expanding apprenticeships into all kinds of new industries. We have set a goal for over 1 million new registered apprenticeships over the next 10 years. That number should be blown out of the water. But we need a goal, so we have a goal, a million new apprentices over the next 10 years. We should be able to destroy that number because there's so many industries that we need it. We're using apprenticeships to help meet the needs on the national challenge, from our supply chain to labor shortages to our cybersecurity needs. Partnerships, it what, it's what makes apprenticeships work. Partnerships also dry, is, drives me in my approach to labor relations. I want to give you a sense of my work. That, that I do on a daily basis. We all know about the rail strike. You read about the rail strike. It was resolved. It wasn't resolved. It got resolved. It got resolved. It wasn't resolved. It is resolved. It's resolved. <laughs> but yesterday, um, Tuesday morning, I, I woke up yesterday morning, and I, uh, or the day before yesterday, Monday, and I jumped on a plane. I went out to Los Angeles, um, and I went at the port of Los Angeles because I, I, well, there's a negotiation going on now with the ILW, the longshoremen on the West Coast, in the port of Los Angeles. I met with the port leadership and the union leadership. We met with trucking companies and, and workers to ensure good jobs and strong supply chain. With the president's direction, we made tremendous progress at the ports. We don't have the backlog we had a year ago at this point, where we had 107 ships out in the Pacific Ocean waiting to come into, into the ports of, of Long Beach and, and Tacoma and Seattle and all up, down, up and down the, the West Coast. We had another record holiday shopping season, and we're making sure that the port employers and the unions work together to ensure they continue the progress making sure those contracts talks stay on, on track. And they have been on track. They've been moving forward. Uh, and, and it's a complicated contract, but I'm not concerned about the contract. I know that we'll get to where we need to get to with that contract. In today's political environment, partnerships is not a very exciting message. It doesn't get you a lot of traction on Twitter. But the fact is, partnerships is what works. It's proven here in the city of Boston, and we proved it in Wa we're proving it in Washington as well. So you know, I have a call to action today. I don't think many in this people in this room need to hear this, but it's worth saying, and it's worth sharing with every single elected official. <clears throat> don't take Boston's success for granted. Don't take Massachusetts' success for granted. I travel across the country, and I see very different realities when I go to different cities in this country. <clears throat> Our success here didn't happen by accident. It certainly didn't happen by dive, uh, driving business against labor and labor against business. It happened by collectively working together. It didn't happen by driving our city against the state or our state against the city. It didn't happen by putting up barriers to investment. And it didn't happen by exploiting workers or stripping away their rights. We passed some of the stronger, strongest worker protection benefits in the nation in this last session. We succeed in Boston by capitalizing on our strength, by addressing our challenges and bringing more people to the table, by working with everyone and by moving forward. And that's how we succeed in the country as well by doing the same things that happen here in this city, continue to move our great country forward. Now is a time of transition for our national economy. There's incredible opportunity ahead to grow regional economies and bring opportunity to more people all across this country. So it's more important now than ever to be strategic, be inclusive, and build partnerships. We need to be open to dialogue and we need to be able to listen when people have something to say. We need to be able to be focused on what it takes to create growth, sustain growth, and share growth equitably. Those words, equitable, we've heard them for a long time. Michael Curry's heard them for a long time. It's a time for action. It's not a time for speeches. It's not a time for promises. It's a time for action, not just here in Boston, but all across the United States of America. I want to uh, just say thank you. I have to give a few shout outs here today because uh, if I don't, I'll get in trouble. So um, <laughs> we have a US attorney with us, Rachel Rawlings. Thanks to see you, US attorney.
We have our City Council President, Eddie Flynn, with us today. We have Suffolk County District Attorney Hayden with us today. We have a bunch of active representatives from the House of Representatives. Uh, I see Bruce E.S. from Quincy here with us today, who's still active. Um, a bunch, Johnny Rogers from Norwood. We have a bunch of old retired guys in the back. You know, Quinn, Casey, all you, Sullivan. Uh, we, have, we have some Republicans with us today, Dan Winslow and Timmy Whalen. Thank you very much for being with us today. But I just want to end by saying thank you. Uh, the opportunity that I've had in my life uh, from being a state representative uh, to running the building trades to serving as this city's mayor of Boston to being the United States Secretary of Labor, it really comes down to the neighborhood. It comes down to the community, the, the street corner I grew up on, the neighborhood I grew up in, where Richie Rouse grew up on the street across on Willow Street. I grew up on Taft Street. I often talk about Taft Street. It laid down the foundation, the community, the families in those neighborhoods laid down the foundation for me, the opportunity to be where I am today. A lot of you in this room gave me that opportunity, too, when you entrusted me to be your mayor the first time and the second time. A lot of you helped me along my journey in other ways as well, whether it's through recovery or other things. I want to thank each and every one of you for the opportunity. I don't take it for granted. T tomorrow I'll be sitting uh, in a cabinet meeting with the president, the vice president, the attorney general will be to my right, uh, the vice president to his right, and to my left, Secretary Granholm. And oftentimes there'll be, I don't know, it's my fourth or fifth cabinet meeting, and when I sit there, like a lot of you, I wonder how the hell did he get there? <laughs> So thank you. Christy Kaufman, Brighton Marine. I just moved from DC. So I'm doing the opposite journey um, that you did. Really excited about the work that James and um, Ivan are doing for DOL Vets. You talked a lot about partnerships. Um, can you talk about how, under your administration, how DOL is more open to working with nonprofits and communities in terms of the transition of veterans? Yeah, I mean, one of the things, in 2015, um, I was down in Washington as the mayor, Michelle Obama, challenged us in the city, uh, challenged us um, to end chronic veterans homelessness by the end of 2015. So I put my hand up, I'm going to do it. I had no idea what the hell I was going to do. I came back to City Hall. I called Sheila Dillon. I go, Sheila, I just committed us that we're going to end veteran, chronic veterans homelessness in the city of Boston by the end of the year. Um, and, and we reached out to Lindy Downey at Pine Street. We reached out to Dr. O'Connell. Uh, you know, we reached out to all the providers and we sat down, we brought everyone into the table. And we came up with a plan on how do we end chronic veterans homelessness. And what came out of that, that collaboration was housing 2,500 chronically homeless people in the city of Boston. We ended chronic veterans homelessness in 2015. There, there was veterans on the street still who weren't, didn't want to come into going to a home, but were able to do that. Uh, collaboration is, I talk about collaboration all the time, uh, especially with our veterans, not just homelessness. It's about jobs and about their families as well. I mean, it's also about empowering their families. A lot of our veterans, a lot of our service men and women uh, get sent somewhere in the country or overseas, uh, and th their families have to go with them, and, and they lose the ability to go into certain grades of work when they work in the federal government. We're trying to change all that now, so we're respecting both the, both the spouse of the service person, but also the service person. Uh, and, and, you know, when I talk about the Good Jobs Initiative, uh, one of the, you know, I talked about women, people of color, Second chances and veterans in rural America. Those are the folks that we're really targeting. So, yeah, we do a lot of that, and, and we will. The, the, the issue on grants, though, the grant's a little funny. You know, it's, it, there's a process on grant making, uh, and there's a process you have to go through, and, and it's, it's very scrutinized. Um, it's not like being the mayor where you can't give the money out. You go through a real process, too. But, <laughs> but sometimes you can be a little more helpful in it. Uh, <laughs> You can't really be that helpful in this because there's a, there's a very competitive process that, that, that people from all over the country look at. Michael. Uh, just curious about what your biggest surprise in your job has been during your tenure. Two years. Um, it, it, the job's very different than being mayor. I mean, when you're the, when you're the Secretary of Labor, you're, you're, 
it's more like being a state rep. It's like it's more like being the legislator because you're going through a process of whether it's rulemaking or trying to pass laws in, on Capitol Hill. Uh, there's always a process and there's so many layers of, of, of government that you have to go through. Uh, and when you're the mayor, it's like, you know, you know, Laura would walk into my office on a Monday, you know, and, and say to me, like, you know, this is going on today. And all day long, there was a new new fire, new crisis. Uh, I remember when, when we uh, were able to get GE, uh, we got a what GE decided to come to Boston and move their global headquarters from from Connecticut up here. Um, you know, I, we celebrated that for about five minutes because five minutes later, there's a crisis that walked through the front door. Um, so, so it's it's a lot different. Uh, you have a little more time to think about it, uh, think about what you want to do. Um, that's why I love being on the road because when I'm on the road, uh, I give a chance to meet with the mayors. So I meet with all the mayors around the country and, and the Congress people. So I get a chance to be on the ground and, and so exactly how do we how do we make change by being on the ground? And I bring that back. And I so I, I have a I'm used to being in a role where I can make something happen, come back and make it happen. And now I'm on a role where I come back and we have to talk through it. But now I'm getting my team to think the same way I, I am. So we're starting to try to cut some of the red tape and make things happen faster. Anybody over here? Welcome back here. to Boston. Tara Levine with Branch Food. Um, Boston's known as a net exporter of technology, fintech, biotech. And one of the areas that I think is still under the radar is the food technology, the agricultural technology, and obviously those technologies have a huge effect on a labor force that grows our food, produces it, distributes it. And I wanted to get your perspective on how we can continue to accelerate the adoption of the stuff, the technology that's coming out of Boston across the country so that we can continue to then lift up the workers who are delivering these foods to us. Yeah, I think the first thing we have to do is get Tom Vilsack here. Um, because usually when you think about agriculture, you're thinking about growers and you're thinking about farmers and you're thinking about the, the actual production of the food and you're not thinking about, about the technology that goes with it. And I think that certainly I would be willing to get uh, Secretary uh, Vilsack here. And then also uh, Isabel Guzman, who's a small business administrator, has been here several times in the city and, and she wants to do a trip. So maybe that's a good trip for us to bring her here and talk about some of the technology that we have. Right. There's another one over here and then I'll go this way. I'm Jessica Lambert with The Base. We are working on, um, I'm very interested in the apprenticeship program that you were talking about. Yeah. Are you envisioning more, or I should say, the, is the administration envisioning it more to be rolled out through public school systems? Are you looking for nonprofit partners? Are we looking to do these within companies themselves? Yeah, great question. The question is about uh, the apprenticeship programs. How do we roll them out, um, whether it's through school districts, uh, nonprofits, companies, all, it's all of the above. Uh, and I'll give you an example. So, so we, we, have a, we have a shortage in this country of cybersecurity experts. We, have, we need about 700,000 cybersecurity experts in the next five years in the United States of America. There's so many jobs open that we don't have enough people. So we brought the industry in the, off, in the White House uh, about four months ago, and we had, it, we had a meeting uh, to talk about creating an apprentice program. So we launched an apprentice program in cybersecurity. Uh, about 112 companies signed up for it. We have 7,100 people in the apprentice program now. Uh, across the country in cybersecurity. Uh, I got a phone call from um, another, Secretary Mundo asked me if I could have, sit down with a 19-year-old kid whose dad had died on a job. So he brought in my office in Washington, we're talking about it. And I said, what do you want to do? He didn't know what he wanted to do. I said, go home and think about it. And he came back, he said, I want to be in cybersecurity. So I was able to make a, he lived in Maryland, I was able to make a phone call to somebody to connect this young man to a cybersecurity apprentice program. We need, to, we need to bring those across the country in, in a big way. So I, the base is absolutely going to be part. We sh you should be part of this conversation. So your dad has, Robert Lewis has my number, so just shoot me a text and we'll take care of it. All right? Secretary, uh, first to come. What's up, Matt? Matt Toledo, Motorola Solutions. Matt, what did you do? Did you still, were you work, where'd you work before? Where did I work? husband of Natalie. Natalie. When I first got elected, Natalie was an aide to, to Rep Verga, and then Matt was in the Republican leader's office, and I don't know how she hooked up with him, but they got married. <laughs> and now, now Matt works at Motorola. Yeah, Matt. Uh, first, we talk on the cybersecurity. So Motorola is clear going in. Can you talk about the cyber? Same thing. We can't find good employees, so we should talk to your agency about how we can coordinate Good Could you give us any insight as to what you think your biggest challenge will be? I think our biggest challenge will be workforce development job training. Um, you know, how do we, when, we when, when I created, when we created Building Pathways or Operation Exit, which is a building trades pre-apprentice program, 
Um, we had plenty of supply of workers. We knew where they were, but we had a team that went out and found them. Uh, we had a team that went out and worked with the gang unit in the police department, went out and worked with the district attorney's office, went out and worked with the courts, went out and worked with the U.S. attorney's office, not the U.S. attorney's office, the judges, well, the U.S. attorney's office too. And, and, and we were able to create a program that was beneficial to a couple hundred people. But the, the challenge is it's more than a couple hundred people that need that program. So what we have to do, my biggest challenge is how do we create an opportunity so people understand that these programs are there and how do we help get these programs started and how do we scale it up in a big way, in a national way. And one of the biggest ways I think we do is through the mayor's offices across the country because they're the closest to the ground. Uh, and I think that that's one. And second, like you, your company, Matt, should, I mean, I'll go back to my office. Your company should know by our work that we have apprentice programs in cybersecurity and you should know that by what we do, not by you should know it because you should know it. So we have to do a better job of getting the word out. So I think it really is about getting the word out, out to people to let, let them know what, what's out there, what, what's active out there. So that's, that's the biggest challenge, 2023, I think. The employees in the room, you know this. I mean, we're all struggling with, with um, finding help, finding employees. Uh, where are we going to find them? Uh, the unemployment rate is 3.7%, which is a pretty low unemployment rate. But the labor participation rate is pretty low as well. Which means that if they were involved in the, if they were participating in the economy, the unemployment rate would be potentially higher. But there's jobs available for people, so there's a lot of opportunities that we have to get out there. We just have to let people know that these jobs are there for them. Thanks, Matt. Good seeing you, Natalie. Career career, oh yeah, career centers. Thank you, thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, um, yeah, the career centers too. I mean, we we do, and that's well, Massachusetts has some amazing career centers, and, and we have. We have American job centers, and, and you know it's kind of funny. So we have American job centers all across the country, and um, first time I ever heard of the word American job center, I'm like, oh my god, we need one of those in Boston. And somebody said, you have two of them in Boston. <laughs> I'm like, I I had no idea we had them in Boston. So again, that's on, that's on us, the Department of Labor and the federal government, to work closer with not just the state, but get those get that information out as well. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you know, Secretary, uh, we are short of workers, but also we have millions of migrants, immigrants, oh, yeah. refugees who want to come here. Are there any discussion, collaboration between your department and State Department and Homeland Security? Yeah, um, I'm not an economist. I'm just going to stop by saying that. Um, there's been a lot of talk by media and other folks that there's going to be a recession. We're going to have a recession. The recession's coming. There's a recession now. We're going to get a recession. I don't know, I don't know if recession's coming or not. I, I, I'm not one of those believers in a recession. I think our economy is strong, and I think we have work to do. But I do think the biggest single threat to our economy right now is lack of workers. And the best way to fix that is by immigration reform. We have 13 million people in our country. We have 13 million people in our country that are undocumented. We have students that come to our colleges here in Boston. They go to BU, BC, Harvard, MIT, Suffolk, uh, Northeast, and wherever they go. And if they're not lucky enough to get a, a, a visa when they graduate, we kick them out. We're the only country in the, in the world that does that. We educate people and kick them out. So we need a comprehensive immigration reform. And we have to separate the conversation of immigration to what we're seeing at the southern border and what the reality of the situation is with immigration. We have to fix the southern border. There's no question about it. But I'll tell you right now, the last two or three, four presidents didn't fix the southern border either. And they claim they did, and people were coming in, and the last president, and the president before that, and the one before that. But we have to fix that problem. There's no question about that. We have to fix that migrant issue. And the way to fix it is not by sticking people on a plane and drop them off in front of the vice president's house or in Martha's Vineyard. That's not how you fix a problem. You address the problem. And, you know, in the past, Republicans and Democrats would get together on a bill to, um, to pass legislation. I'm not sure if they can do that today because there's, there's a little bit of, of extremes on other, each side of the party that don't allow in a lot of ways collaboration. But I hope there was a bill moving through the Congress that didn't go through, but that we need to pass immigration reform. We have to. And we have to also figure out a pathway for immigration and for, for, for visa programs in our country. We have to. I mean, if we don't, um, that's, our, that's a threat to our economy. Any last questions? As a small business owner, one of the biggest expenses I have is health care for my employees. Is there something happening or you're working on something in regard to No, there, there was, there's a little bit of a fix in the Inflation Reduction Act. I don't know if that helps you. 
uh, with the with the with the health care. There was a bill. Congress did some action, but again, that goes back to trying to get both sides to agree on, on, on a pathway forward. Uh, I know there was some action. I, I don't have all the information on it, but I know there was some a bill that was going to go through Congress that was going to ease the burden on, on employers a little bit this year, and it, I don't think it finalized. I know the inflation, how, whatever the Inflation Reduction Act, if there's any help in that, there's not. But I can, I'll get your information. I can have small business administrator administration get in touch with you to see what's out there. I don't have a good answer for you on that one. So related, uh, Matthew Albright from Zealous. No Surprises Act is in its second year. Um, do you want to reflect on how the first year went for the No Surprises Act in terms of protecting patients and maybe what the second year is going to look like? Yeah. On the healthcare stuff, I haven't done a lot in healthcare here, so I don't have a lot of information on that, so I'd be completely making up if I started talking about it. <laughs> and I don't want to do that right now. Uh, no, it, yeah, honestly, uh, that's Secretary... Secretary Becerra and, and Health and Human Services doing a lot of work on that, and, and it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't have the information on that. But I can get anything you want. I get information you have to. All right, last question. Martha Day with JLL. Um, what kind of collaboration is there between your department um, and just related to housing, retaining not just finding employees but keeping them where we need them, uh, with, with housing costs being what they are, construction costs being what they are. Yeah, housing's not a federal. I don't think housing should. The federal government never really invest in housing other than um, housing developments, so HUD. You know, so it really is a regional issue that we have to get together on as a city, state, region on how to build housing. And I don't think you can't wait for the federal government to, to, to f save the housing markets in that area. And I think that when I talked about, you know, when I became the mayor, um, one of the first things we did was we put together a housing plan. Uh, to create 59,000 uh, units of new housing by the year 2030. Uh, and the reason for it is, I'm, on one end, I'm going on and try, trying to attract business to the city of Boston to come here. I'm trying to keep people in the city of Boston, and I realize the prices were going up for people to buy homes, so we, create, we need to buy new housing. We got about 50,000 units of housing permitted and in, in, in the pipeline in the first, I think, Brian, right, right, first year maybe, and then we raised that, we went back out and did another bill to 69,000 units of new housing by the year 2030. You need an aggressive housing plan. You need to use all the tools you can. And I know that uh, when I was here, we used vacant lots to build one and two and three family homes all across the city. I know the current administration is doing the same thing. Chill Dillon's still there, so they're doing that. But you really have to, housing has to be built on a, by, by it can't be built by public housing. And the public housing aspect of it, uh, the housing developments, we have to invest in that project. I mean, in the city of Boston, what we did was we, the sale of Winthrop Square Garage was $159 million, um, in, and we put... Uh, a good chunk of that money into public housing to, to refurbish public housing here in the city of Boston. Old Colony, phase one. I believe some money went to Bromley Heath. So you're trying to create new ways. That, that's not a space that the federal government should be in, I don't think. They can't build private housing. So that's what I would say. And I think you guys know it too. I mean, I, I would just, you know, continue, you need a good aggressive housing plan. And, and regionalization. I, I know the governor, listen, the governor's not going to get credit for the MBTA because everyone just beats him up on the MBTA. But he laid down a foundation for the MBTA by making investments in the infrastructure. The MBTA is not going to be turned around tomorrow. I mean, it's not going to be turned around tomorrow. It's going to be a 10, 20, 20-year 20 project to get the MBTA to where it needs to be. But the investments, the governor started by making those investments in the infrastructure of the MBTA. I think when, you, when it comes to housing and jobs and opportunity, uh, I was a big regional approach guy. Um, I, was a, I worked with Joe Sullivan. He was the mayor of Braintree. Uh, we worked really closely together on, on making sure that, that we did a regional approach, whether it was, you know, you, you, you're working in Boston, you're living in Braintree, you're living in Quincy, you're living in Milton, you're living in, in Waltham, wherever you're living. Uh, that's, I think that's another thing. You have to think more regionally. And a lot of times in, in Massachusetts, we think more parochial about our own little turf. Uh, when you think about economic development and housing, it, is a region, it has to be a regional approach. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. Take care. Be well. Thank you. Thanks, Dan.